As we come to our worship, our call to worship comes from Jonah 2, verse 9. Jonah 2, verse 9. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Friends, let's come and sing of this salvation which uh, Sammy has spoken of in this verse from the book of Jonah. We want to use the words of Psalm 96, uh, the B version. The words are on the screen. The tune is Zera number 244. Uh, the call comes to sing a new song to the Lord, to bless his name. And then this most wonderful message that we see in, in line, the third, the fourth line, he saves each day, proclaim our God is the God of salvation. We saw that this morning. Despite our great sin, our great rebellion against him, God in his mercy has looked down on us in his mercy and has uh, brought about this wonderful salvation that, that we know that we have tasted in Christ and we want to return our worship and our praise to him with thankful hearts. We'll sing uh, verses 1 to 3 and then verse 6, I invite you if you can to stand to worship God. Once again, we thank you for this opportunity to meet as your people, to come into your presence with songs of praise and worship on our lips flowing from our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you give us these words to help us to know how to worship you, how to describe what you have done and who you are, words that speak of your salvation and the joy that we have of proclaiming your salvation. We confess, Lord, that uh, often we are slow to do that. We are hesitant. We are fearful. But we, we sing these words and we sing of your glory and your power, your awesome splendor. And we, we wonder why are we so hesitant? Why are we so slow to speak and to tell of the Lord and what he has done? But we confess that that is often the case, and so we pray that you would forgive us for that, and that you would fill us with such a, a vision of who you are and what you have done, 
that our, our lips and our hearts are overflowing with praise and worship and uh, bearing witness to the world around us of how great our God is. We thank you, Father, that uh, we have that privilege and that opportunity to speak words of truth and witness to those who are living in darkness. We thank you that you choose to use people such as ourselves. You, you don't need us. You don't need us to do that. You could send your angels to proclaim and to announce the good news as you did at the birth of Jesus. But you choose to use frail and humble and weak and uh, often faltering human beings such as ourselves because in our weakness your power and your glory are seen. Lord, we cannot claim any glory for ourselves and so we are able to point people not to us, not to our church, not to our own wisdom, but to the great God of heaven and earth. And we pray that you give us a greater burden to do this uh, collectively, individually. And we pray, Lord, that through us and through our witness, you'll be pleased to make your name known, to make Christ known among the nations. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to worship you together. And we pray that as we meet here, we would know your Spirit's help among us, that you would presence yourself with us we we'll be conscious of the, the presence of Almighty God. We're, we're not in a spectacular cathedral. We're not in a, in a building that stands out as being particularly beautiful. But what's special about this place is that God is here among us. And so we pray that we would know your presence. We would know your voice. We would hear it. We would be attentive to it. And we would respond with humility and obedience and faith speak lord because we your servants are listening and we pray that as we meet we would do so with a clear conscience we confess our sin to you we thank you that in christ there is forgiveness we thank you that in christ our sin is covered and so we do confess our sin before you and ask that and that sin would be covered by the blood of our savior jesus christ so bless us in all that we do, in all that we say, and on all our meditation on your word. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to sing uh, again, this time from Psalm 14. Samuel was saying that it's four years since I preached in English. It's something like that. There are times when there's a, just a mental block in my head, and I think, I, how do you say that in English? I'm not sure. And so I'm, I'm fighting constantly not to speak in French. Um, but uh, that my mind casts back to this psalm. It's the very first sermon I preached. It was on Psalm 14 many, many years ago. And uh, I, I remember being struck by the relevance of it to our world today. It's written thousands, thousands of years ago. But it describes perfectly the world in which we live. We, we want to understand our world. We want to, to under, make sense of what's happening around us. When we see the news, when we read the, the papers, when we listen to the news and the radio, we want to understand why is the world the way it is? Why are, are, are people behaving this way? And this psalm is, gives a very clear explanation of that. The fool has said within his heart, there surely is no God. And what happens when people say there is no God? They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. Not one of them does good. There is an inevitable moving further and further into sin when we deny the existence of God, when we try to live without God. That shouldn't surprise us when we see it in our world, but we need to understand it. This is why it's happening men and women have rejected God. They have abandoned the idea of God. Uh, and thus, we should expect to see the results of that. We'll see that tonight as we look at the, the second half of the chapter in Genesis 4. But this psalm is not without hope. If you look at verses 5 and 6, 
For there they were in dread, for God is ever with the just. God hasn't abandoned this world. Plans of the poor you would confound because God is his trust. We're called out, we're called to trust in God in this world of unbelief. And there's this plea that God would send salvation. May Zion send deliverance and help to Israel bring. And then there's this affirmation, the Lord restores his prisoners and Jacob he will sing so yes we look at the world and we analyze the world and we understand the world but instead of wringing our hands and saying this is a terrible terrible place we turn to God and put our confidence in God that he will send deliverance and we we he restores us and we praise him and we worship him despite all that we're seeing around us so let's stand uh, once again. The tune we're going to use is Abbeville, number 41. Let's sing this psalm to God uh, in worship. I've been asked to bring a short update on uh, our work in Nantes uh, and I'd like to take that opportunity to do that now. Um, without going into lots of details you'll be I imagine aware that for some time we've been planning uh, a building project. Uh, that was a long time in the planning. Uh, we had to get planning permission which took longer than what we expected it would but we eventually got it and uh, that was an a October, we got news of that and so we then started looking for uh, builders and joiners and uh, all sorts of people who would come and 
Uh, work on that. The work was due to start in, uh, it did start in April with the knocking down of our garage and the clearing away of a bit of vegetation beside the house where the building would be. And we were hoping that uh, the building would begin in the first week of May. Uh, but unfortunately, that didn't uh, work out. Well, I say unfortunately, in the providence of God, that didn't work out. And I must confess, it was a frustrating time. It was a difficult time. We were dealing with a builder uh, who was not being honest with us, who was dodging uh, our efforts to contact him, who was coming up with all sorts of reasons, some quite ridiculous why he couldn't start. And that was that was frustrating, we must say. Uh, and eventually we came to the stage where we felt we couldn't continue working or, or not working uh, with that builder. And so we made the decision uh, in June to cut links with him and to sever that contract. Now that we knew that that would mean having to go and find a new builder. And in God's goodness, we were able to do that. Uh, a new builder who will be able to start in, God willing, in October, the start of October. Now that's four months lost. But I know for certain that in three years' time, uh, we will not be sitting thinking, is that terrible? We lost those four months away back in 2022. Uh, that that will soon be a distant memory, we, we trust. And again, remarkably, we, we, we believe in God's providence. We believe that God is at work in all things for his glory and for our good. And as I sent a message to the church WhatsApp group uh, saying the name of the new builder, one of our ladies in church, she's the only Christian in her family, her husband's not a, a believer, she replied to say, my husband works for that builder. Uh, and so this husband who opposes quite vehemently his wife coming to our church could end up building our church, uh, which he so opposes. And uh, we, we would pray that God would use that, that contact with us to show him that we are not the people he thinks we are. We're not the freakish, uh, cult-like people that he thinks we are. We, we, we get on reasonably well with this guy on a personal level, but it's just our church, he's, he thinks we're a bit of a cult, uh, which we're not. So uh, well, clearly we see God's hand in that, uh, bringing Antonio, his name's Antonio, uh, into contact with us in this way. And we pray that God would use it to soften his, his attitude, firstly towards our church, and secondly towards God uh, himself. And then again, in the providence of God, had the builder originally started when he was supposed to, uh, the the mission, the, the Go Relief team would already have been out and would already have done their work, except they would have been doing it during a heat wave. Uh, and we wouldn't have needed uh, two other men to come and do work at the back of the house. And so because the, the Go Relief team wasn't able to come out, these two men, the architect and his brother-in-law, came to do work at the back of the house. And they got talking to Malcolm and Muriel. And it turns out that the, the, the architect's brother-in-law, his ex-wife, was a Jehovah's Witness. And so he had all sorts of questions that he was asking Malcolm and Muriel. And there is no one better equipped, I think, in the French language to speak on Jehovah's Witnesses than Malcolm Ball. He has spent hours dealing with, uh, hours and hours dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses. So this man couldn't have asked, be asking his questions to a better person. And he has said that he would like to come to church. Now, again, we wouldn't have had that contact with that man had we stuck with the original builder. And so even in a short space of time since we uh, said goodbye to the builder, we've seen how God has uh, been at work uh, in, in ways that we would never uh, expect. Uh, working through the book of Acts uh, recently in church, we, we kept noticing how uh, seeming disasters, seeming uh, setbacks for the church where the church might have been tempted to say this is terrible uh, Peter's in prison, Peter and John are in prison James has been killed, Stephen's been killed what good can come of this and time and time again God turned the situation around and used it to further uh, his kingdom and so we trust that that is what God will do in this uh, story and this episode with the builder that God will use that uh, to further his work in ways that we could only imagine, or couldn't even imagine, we could only dream about. That's what God does. He surprises us time and time again. 
So uh, please pray that uh, the rest of the building work would go according to God's plan and that if that means further delay that we would be willing to accept that uh, and uh, go forward with patience and with trust, not allowing ourselves to get frustrated, uh, meditating in Psalm 37, <laughs> but how to deal with people who are, are, are wicked and who are crooks, that's what our builder turned out to be, and dealing with such people in a, a Christ-like way. Other matters for prayer that I would ask you to pray about uh, next week, the Go Relief team arrives on the 22nd, we get home on the 19th, uh, they arrive on the 22nd. Just last night I was waking up thinking, is that ready? Is that ordered? Is that in place? Uh, and, and there are one or two things need to be still got ready for that team coming. Uh, Sammy is planning to be with the team uh, and so we're looking forward to having that involvement from from Dervik, we know that you'll be involved in praying for the work, but also sending Sammy to uh, to help out with that. It's a great uh, blessing. So pray for the men as they come. There are nine who are coming to build a, a patio, to lay a patio, to do some painting. And I have a few other ideas of what they might be able to do uh, if if time should allow them. The temperature is due to come down. It was Yesterday it was 37, which wouldn't be very pleasant to work in. It is coming down. It's down today and it's to stay down around mid to, mid to high 20s while the men are there. So we're, we're thankful for that, that it's not going to be a heat wave. Uh, another matter for prayer is uh, two students that we know are joining with us next year, Erin uh, Peel, the daughter of Warren and Ruth Peel. Uh, she's spending a year working in a school nearby us and also uh, a young lady from America whose family were with us for two years uh, up until uh, last year. And she has just finished her studies in the States and she's coming to work in the same school as Erin. Uh, already we've had Helen McKelvey from Kalibaki and Lydia Pollock from Ballylagan working in that school and worshipping with us. So uh, we seem to just feed them English language assistance, Christian English language assistance. And those girls have been a blessing to us uh, in many ways. And so we pray, please pray for Erin and for uh, Olivia as they come uh, in the next really couple of weeks. Pray for their witness. They have access to people that we don't have access to uh, and pray for them and uh, pray that God would use them uh, in many ways. We, we're, we're starting up again our activities. It's really the first year back uh, to full activities without COVID. Well, we say without COVID, but with fewer restrictions because of COVID. Uh, and so we pray that we would ask you to pray that uh, we would uh, be wise in, as we choose what activities to, to plan and to, to go forward with. Uh, obviously, the new building, when it's ready in April, God willing, will give us more opportunities. We're hearing about the opportunities that you folks have here in Dervik because of the, the facilities that you have. We do envisage uh, more opportunities for different uh, forms of outreach once we have our building uh, open and running. And so pray that, you, that God would give us wisdom and imagination, creativity, as we plan to reach out into the community around us. It's a very needy community, uh, socially, uh, a lot of social deprivation uh, in and around where we live, and we want to be salt and light uh, in that area, we don't want to just wring our hands and say yuck, uh, but we want to have compassion for the folks living in these areas and for our neighbours as well. We pray for our neighbours. They, they've been very interested in the project, the building project. They're, they're, they're relatively supportive. We haven't heard really any uh, criticisms or complaints. That might change once the building starts. We trust not. Uh, but just pray that we would have an impact with our neighbours that, that we think they'll come to when the church is open, they'll come to meetings, they'll come to the opening at least, or other things that we would invite them to. So pray that uh, initial contacts that we've had with our neighbours or relationships that are good, that those would develop uh, into uh, gospel opportunities to reach out and to explain uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to these folks. I, I could give you a, a lot more, a lot longer list, but I think I'll stop with that. Just remember... Uh, give thanks for the, the, the solutions that we've had in, in dealing with a difficult builder. Uh, pray for the relationship with the new builder, that all the other people who are due to 
intervene in the project that they would be able to fit that into their schedule which has all been thrown up in the air uh, pray for our witness to the builders and to all those who come onto the site uh, pray for Aaron and Olivia who are coming and just pray for us as we start up our activities once again in the coming uh, the coming months perhaps uh, I could pray lead us in prayer for that and also let, allow me to pray for you uh, here in Dervik and we can pray for the two congregations uh, represented here today so as you keep your seats we'll pray together Father we thank you for the joy that comes uh, in partnership in the gospel we see the Apostle Paul writing about that in his letters of how he speaks so fondly of those who are partners uh, with him in the work of the gospel and uh, we in, in Nantes we are so thankful for the partnership that we have uh, with our denomination here at home but also with uh, congregations and with individuals within those congregations and we thank you father for I want to thank you this evening for uh, the missionary vision that you have given to the congregation here in Dervik for their concern for the work of missions throughout the world and father i pray that uh, as they regularly meet to pray and to support in different practical and financial ways that you would encourage the the, the folks here uh, to know that their work of sending and praying and supporting uh, is not a work that is in vain and we pray lord that they would be encouraged to to persevere in that work especially in the work of prayer we know how easy it is uh, to lose heart in praying and to give up and to move on to other things and that work of persistent regular faithful praying is a difficult work so we pray that you would strengthen the folks here as they continue to pray especially for the work in Nantes we thank you for the links that there have been uh, over many years uh, going back uh, even as far as the first go teams uh, when Eileen was leading those teams and we thank you for the many links over many years and we thank you even that this uh, this summer that link has been strengthened and uh, developed by our time here and by Sammy coming uh, in the, the go relief team in a couple of weeks time and so father may your people here be encouraged as they support the work of the gospel in France we rejoice to how and how you have answered prayers regarding our building work we thank you that we have a new builder ready to come in in October we pray Lord that there are few remaining issues with the former builder would soon be resolved that he would have a change of heart uh, in the areas where he's being stubborn and difficult and we pray Lord that you would bring him to repentance even as he considers how he is treating us uh, at the moment and so we pray that uh, the building work would go ahead uh, as planned and that you would use our witness to those who come on site to speak the gospel into many hearts and lives we pray in particular for Antonio that he would be uh, assigned to this project and that he would uh, be able to work with us and see that uh, we are not the people he thinks we are we're not people to be afraid of but that he will see Christ in our in our lives in our words in our actions and that he would indeed be drawn to uh, his, his his wife's savior and his savior and that joy we would have the joy of seeing him converted we pray for Aaron and Olivia who will be coming in a couple of weeks pray that you would help them as they prepare to come and as they uh, move and settle in we pray that you would make them to be a witness for you in school amongst the students and the staff and even the parents we pray that they'll be a blessing to us as well in the congregation pray for the team coming out to work uh, from the church here and pray that uh, for harmony in that team for safety as they travel and as they work and again we pray for their witness to the neighbors who will no doubt see them and hear them and even have a chance to talk with them and so we pray that you would use them not just in uh, the physical work that they'll be doing but also the spiritual uh, work and the spiritual input that they will have 
in their time in Nantes. And Father, we pray that as we look forward to going back, uh, the starting up of activities, we pray, Lord, that uh, we would have wisdom in knowing which activities to maintain, which ones to change and to, to do differently or to do better. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the energy that we need and the, the zeal, uh, which we confess is sometimes lacking, and pray that we would be motivated and inspired by the, and constrained by the love of Christ to go to a world in need. And what we pray in that regard for our work in Nantes, I want to pray as well for the work here in Dervik. We thank you for the faithfulness of your people over many years and pray that as they look forward to September and the activity starting again, that they would have that energy and that enthusiasm which we need, that zeal that comes from you and pray that as the different forms of outreach take place, the mums and tots, the youth club, the bowls or whatever it might be, we pray Lord that you would draw people to those activities and that they would uh, there will be opportunities to speak of Christ to those who are uh, dead in their sins and living in darkness. We commit the upcoming congregational meeting to you as well and pray that you would uh, bless the congregation with harmony and with unity as they consider making out a call uh, to one who would come to be pastor here in this place. We pray, Lord, that you, you know exactly uh, what the future holds, you know exactly who will come, when they will come. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide your people here, give them wisdom, give them discernment, and help them, Lord, especially to have one heart and one mind as they move forward. Bless the elders and their responsibility and help them, Lord, to, to shepherd your people uh, through difficult times, times uh, when they would prefer and long to have a, a pastor, a full-time pastor, we pray, Lord, that you would give the grace and the strength that is needed to elders and to the committee as well as they uh, seek to give direction and leadership at this time. So we thank you that we can bring these prayer requests before you, that you hear our prayers, and that in your way and in your time, you will answer those prayers for your glory and for our good. And we pray them in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. If you would turn, please, in your Bible, we're going to read the second part of Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. And we'll begin our reading at verse 17. Well, verse 16. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. 
And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. <clears throat> and very quickly, if you would turn to Luke chapter 3, we'll not read this whole section, I'm aware that time is going on, but in Luke chapter 3, <clears throat> Luke chapter 3, verse 23. We're just going to read one or two verses at the start and then the verses at the end. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matta, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, and so on. Down to verse, 30, verse 36. The son of Canaan, the son of Aphraxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, and the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Amen. Uh, do you have an evening offering? We do? Well, at this point in our service, we shall have our, our evening offering. I want to encourage you to think for a few moments about the world we live in. Think about what has happened in our world in the last hundred years. Uh, over 100 years ago, or 100 years ago, who could ever have imagined a smartphone? Apologies to you if you don't know what a smartphone is. Who could have imagined 100 years ago a man walking on the moon. I was talking to my cousin today who was speaking about her husband who was going to ha who could have had surgery done by robots. Uh, stuff of our wildest dreams a hundred years ago. Cars that don't need a driver. Who would have thought of it? It would be easy to say that our world, and it would be correct to say, that our world is an amazing place. It is a truly amazing place. Yet at the same time, our prisons are packed. There is more and more violence on the streets, in our homes. The 20th century was the bloodiest century in the history of mankind. And we all know what has happened in the last three years, up to today. We have more and more things to make us happy, yet we are less and less happy. One could say, we could say that the history of our world, while we've got all these marvellous things taking place, we could say the history of our world is a horror story. So how are we to understand this? How can you understand brilliance and horror? all in the same world. And many books and articles have been written to explain our world, and you can read them, you can get them in the library, you can buy them in bookshops, you can read them online, but none of them will describe and explain the world better than this book, and better than this chapter that we've just read. A book written three and a half thousand years ago, and it's interesting, is it not, that to understand the world today, we turn to such an old book. You see, as we look at this book uh, this evening, it's an honest book, it's a realistic book, and it explains our world as we know it. 
Not always pleasant to read, but honest and realistic. And once again, we see ourselves in it. So in verse 16, we saw this this morning, this terribly sad verse, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, what would you expect to read next? Uh, the, 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 one of the human beings living, one of the three human beings that we know of alive, uh, one of the three human beings alive at that time because Seth hadn't been born, chooses to turn us back on God. What would you expect to see next? How does that work out for him and for his family? Well, let's look and see. What do we see? The first thing we see is a happy and a prosperous world. And it would be much easier for us as believers to look at a world where God is excluded, where, 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 where men have chosen to walk away from God and see only negative things. That, w- that would probably comfort us a bit more. Will you see what happens? See what happens when you choose to abandon God? Nothing goes right. But that's not the case. That's not what we see. Here's a world without God. We'd like to be, it would be easier to be able to say, here's a world without God. There's nothing good. There's nothing positive. But it's just not the case. In verses 17 to 22, we see many positive things. Many things that we would want to applaud. In verse 17, we see family life. It says Cain knew his wife and she became pregnant. Here's an intimate relationship between Cain and his wife. Cain, yes, he has killed his brother but, and he's rejected God. But it's, it's quite possible that Cain is a very good husband. And a very good father. And in, in building a city, we read that he builds a city. Cain seems to have the desire to give stability to his family. Is that not a good thing? You want your family to have stability. He seems to have a normal, blessed and prosperous life. God has blessed him with a family. He has his place to live. And we see from verses 20 to 22 that the descendants of Cain are endowed with extraordinary abilities. The three children of Lamech who are mentioned here, if you look at them in verse 20, Jabal, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Here is the father of of farmers, of farming, the father of traders, of business. Here are the origins of a world of commerce. That's a good thing. Verse 21, Jubal, He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Here is the first musician. Here is the first sign of culture and of the arts, things that make life more pleasant, creativity that makes life more enjoyable. We all benefit from culture. Here's the father of Mozart and of Monet and the Beatles and you can decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Verse 22, Tubal Cain, he was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Here's the beginning of heavy industry, of the making of tools to make work easier, to make it less painful and more efficient. Those are all good things. Good things coming from a family that had rejected God. And when we see these pioneers in these different fields, we must recognise the enormous contribution that they made to the advance of human civilization. The world benefited from their skills and their ingenuity. Life is better. Life is more pleasant. Thanks to men who rejected God. And so we must recognize that all unbelieving man can do, even after rejecting God, we must recognize that there is an enormous amount of good that unbelieving men can do, and women. We still see it today. You all benefit from the brilliance of men and women in the fields of technology, science, medicine, culture, arts. We thank God for these gifted men and women. We can't just say the world is all terrible. God in his common grace has blessed men and women with tremendous ability from which we all benefit. 
However, all these wonderful advances in many fields do not hide the dark reality behind them. So we see a happy and prosperous world, but we also see a world dominated by evil and sin. The advances in farming, technology, commerce, uh, arts, they're all very real, but they're also accompanied at the same time in this passage by a downward spiral into sin and into rebellion against God. Uh, and now what's the evidence for that downward spiral? Well, look at verse 17. We see, then Cain built a city. Well, where's the evil in building a city? Is that not a good thing to do, to build a city? Well, look at verse 12, which is part of God's judgment against Cain for the murder of his brother. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. You're going to roam the earth, said God. You're not going to settle down. Cain says, yes, I am. Cain does not accept the judgment of God. He says to God, I'll do exactly what I want to do. I don't care about your judgment. So here's proof of his rebellion against God. I'm going to find a city and I'm going to settle there. And Cain continues to say no to God. The Hebrew experts, it's interesting, the Hebrew experts tell us that a better translation of this would be he was building a city to God. And they tell us that behind that is the suggestion that he didn't get it finished. He wanted to build a city. He was building, but didn't complete it. Did God stop him? Did God thwart him like he did the Tower of Babel? We don't know. That's just what the, the passage seems to be uh, inferring. Then verse 19, this downward spiral into sin continues. And the author focuses on Lamech, the seventh generation of Adam's family. And he does this to show us how humanity is moving away from God in seven, uh, how far it's moving away in seven generations. He wants to show us the full extent of the sin and rebellion against God. And there, in verse 19, there's a phrase that captures our attention straight away. We see Lamech took two wives. And this sentence comes a few verses after the, the passage where the author Moses presents monogamy, having one wife, as the norm given for God and for the family. You know that for this reason a man shall leave his husband and uh, his mother and father and be united to his wife, his one wife. Lamech takes two wives. Too bad for God's law, I will do what I want. God has no right to tell me whether I take one, two, three, or how many wives that I want. And the text seems to tell us his reasons for taking these two women when we're given their names and we look at the meaning of their names. Ada means beautiful or pretty. And the second is Zilla, and that comes from the verb to tinkle or to jingle. And that, we're told, might refer to her seductive voice. And we see in these details that Lamech is a man governed not by his desire to please God, his desire to walk in the ways of God, but he's a man dominated by his own desires, dominated by his sensual desires. And they trump what he might know of God's law. I know God said that, but I want to do things my way because that pleases me. That appeals to me. God says one woman. Lamech says, well, if you see a beautiful woman and you want her, well, why not? It makes us think of the verse in Ecclesiastes 2 that says, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. It doesn't matter what God says. If it's pleasure that I want, I'm going for it. That's how Lamech lives. Then thirdly, we see in verses 23 and 24 an even darker picture. We've already seen the invention of music and, and culture. But here we have the first po a poem uh, in this chapter. Poetry can be a beautiful and uplifting thing, but not Lamech's poetry. 
His poem is bloody and arrogant. It's a horror poem. Look at his pride. It's, he's full of himself. My voice, my words, I killed, wounding me, striking me. He boasts in front of his wives. He boasts of killing a young man. So here he continues in the line of killers. But he actually goes much further than Cain. Cain in verse 13 spoke of his fault. Even though he didn't repent of it. But he at least recognizes his fault. What does Lamech do? Far from admitting his fault. He claims for the murder of a young man and he's boasting of it. I killed a man, a young man. Adam and Eve hid themselves after their sin. Lamech brags about his sin. There's no question of being ashamed. And the violence of Lamech is a disproportionate violence. He had been hurt by a boy he had been hurt by a little boy a little bruise but he takes the life of this young man this young boy he believes that his life is more important than the lives of others God had said that Cain's death would be avenged seven times it was a warning given by God against those who might want to kill Cain. Well, Lamech says in his arrogance that he will be avenged 70 times. He doesn't seek divine protection. I don't need God's protection. I look after myself. No need for God to protect me. I'm strong. I'm to be feared. Nobody would dare hurt me. This is appalling arrogance. And isn't this attitude so different from the attitude of Jesus? Lamech who was wronged and who seeks vengeance, disproportionate vengeance. How did Jesus react when he was wronged? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I wonder if Jesus was thinking of Lamech when he said in Matthew 18 that we must be ready to forgive, not seven times, but 70 times seven. I wonder, was he thinking of Lamech who refused to forgive and overlook the hurt done to him? And this is the world without God. This is what happens when you do what Cain did in verse 16, when you go out from the presence of the Lord. This is the world that banishes God from his thoughts. It's a permissive world. Do what seems right to you. It's a violent world, a proud world a world where no value is attached to human life. And God here describes for us a world where we choose to ignore him. We don't recognize in such a world that our ability to create, to build, to invent, it all comes from God. That ability comes from God, but we don't see that. It's a gift from God, but we don't thank God. We do nothing for the glory of God when we walk away from him. Instead of giving thanks to God for his gifts, we take the gifts of science, intelligence, culture, commerce, family, and we make these things our gods, our idols. We bow down to the gifts instead of bowing down to the giver. Instead of worshipping the one who gives us these things, we use them to show that he doesn't exist. So what do we need to learn from this world that's so, at the same time, so creative and so brilliant and yet so sinful and rebellious? Well, there are two main things that we learn from this world. Firstly, culture, industry, creativity cannot ever offer redemption ever being sophisticated and culturally industrially commercially brilliant cannot restore our relationship with God science is a good thing 
Good science is a good thing. Good culture is a good thing. It's good to encourage research, innovation and creativity. Those are good things. But these can never solve our biggest problem. Never. They can never change the human heart, really change the human heart. They may make life more enjoyable for a while. And they do. They do that. But they cannot deal with our greatest problem, a broken relationship with God. Humans have managed to split the atom. They put a man on the moon. They can talk to people on the other side of the world, seeing their face at the same time, which is incredible. It's incredible. But they can't heal that relationship that's broken by sin. They can't. They can't even want to. Man has never been able to erase his sin. He's never overcome the evil in his heart. He remains lost in his sin. Man spends his time filling his life with good things. But he forgets the most important thing. And maybe even here there's someone and you're a good dad or you're a good mum, you're a good grandparent, you're a good neighbour, you're kind, you're generous, you've done well in your work, you've done well in many things, but you've overlooked the most important thing. And that's your relationship with God. It's possible. You've many talents, many talents, but the problem of your sin hasn't yet been dealt with. Is that is that possible for someone tonight? And if so, your talents, everything you've accomplished in life, they count actually for nothing. And Jesus has a question for you this evening. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, to be the best at this, at that, but to lose his soul? The, the, the rugby player, Johnny Wilkinson, the English rugby player, he won the World Cup. He was the hero of that win in 2003. And as he walked around the stadium holding up the cup to the adoring fans in his heart, he was saying, is this it? Is this as good as it gets? Is this what it's all about? Already emptiness was coming into his heart. He'd worked all his life to get to this point. He thought, it's so fleeting. The most important thing was missing. He turned to Buddhism. It's tragic. So we learn that culture, industry and all those things cannot offer redemption. Secondly, we also learn that in thousands of years since the life of Cain and Lamech, the human heart has not changed. Society has not changed. We're still living in a society where God is largely excluded. We recognize this permissive society that makes fun of what God says about marriage, what God says about the, the, the value of human life. We recognize that. We recognize that this violent society. Yes, it's a society that makes amazing progress. But rarely, rarely stops to give thanks to God. And to give glory to God. The world of Lamech and our world are not that different. And these verses help us... To better, better to understand our world, don't they? It's been like this for thousands of years. And at that time in, in the history of humanity, you might have been tempted to say, where, where has God gone? Where has God gone? God had promised to save. In Genesis 3.15, God said that the woman's offspring would crush the serpent's head, that he would overcome evil. Well, God, you promised this salvation. You promised this deliverance, but evil is prospering, God. The descendants of Satan are dominating. Where are you, God? Have you forgotten your promise? Can you not keep your word? That leads us to the last thing we see in this passage and that's the promise of God fulfilled the promise of God fulfilled we see it in the last few verses from 
verse 25 onwards. Verse 25 reads, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. The author wants to show us here, despite appearances, despite appearances, despite the evil that is dominating, God is still at work. God continues to show grace. God continues to work out his plan, despite what it looks like. God's plan of redemption will not be thwarted. And Eve knows of this plan. God explained it to her. She remembers the promises of God. And this is the first time we see the word offspring in the Bible. It's in the promise of Genesis 3.15. The offspring of the woman will crush the head of Satan. Now Abel, Eve had hoped that that would be Cain or Abel. But Abel is dead and Cain is gone. And so another offspring is needed. And in his grace, God provides that offspring, that seed. The name Seth means granted or appointed. And Seth is appointed by God to be the father of the chosen line. From the line of Seth, one will come who would crush the head of Satan. That's what we read in those verses from Luke chapter 3. The fulfillment of that promise from the line of Seth. God is still at work here. He's not frustrated by the evil of Cain and Lamech and their like. Evil, violence, rebellion, hatred cannot ever thwart the eternal purposes of God. Despite appearances, God's at work. God will fulfill his promises. And isn't it true that many times in the Bible we see God at work despite evil appearances and we see it supremely at the cross where evil seems to dominate. Evil seems to win. The Son of God Cruelly beaten, mistreated, nailed to a Roman cross by violent, rebellious, incredulous people, just like Lamech, who boast of what they've done. Where's God? He seems to be absent, but God is fulfilling his promise. The promised offspring was crushing the head of Satan and gaining salvation for his people. It didn't look like it. In the darkest moment of the history of mankind, God's at work. So let's trust God. Let's trust God. Let's not lose hope. Let's not despair. In spite of what you see, God is at work. Working out his will. Paul describes this in Romans 5.20 where sin abounded. Grace abounded even more. And in the world of Seth, sin abounded, but the grace of God abounded even more. The same thing at the cross and the same thing today. Sin abounds, but grace abounds. God is still at work. God's grace continues to abound where sin abounds. And what happens when God's grace abounds verse 26 answers that question people begin to call on the name of the lord seth and his children are pioneers in the regular and habitual praise and worship of god despite what's happening all around them despite the pressure to conform to the world seth and his children believe in God. They serve God. They put God at the center of their lives. They recognize their need of God. The name Enoch speaks of the fragility of human life. And so we see the humility of Seth in giving that name to his son. He recognizes his dependence on God. The world around refuses to acknowledge this. 
The world around does not ask God to forgive, does not seek God's grace and God's mercy, but Seth does. Seth and his family call on the name of the Lord. And what an encouragement for those of us who live in a world like Seth's. What an encouragement for us to love the Lord, to serve the Lord, to follow the Lord, to live for him, despite the immense hostility that we see in the world around us. How on earth can you bring up children in this world today so hostile to God and his world? Well, by God's grace you do it, as Seth did it. Standing firm against a tsunami of mockery and ridicule and hostility. Call on the name of the Lord. Even if you're the only one like our sister and aunt in your family and your husband mocks you, call on the name of the Lord. If you're the only one in your workplace, call on the name of the Lord. Of the Lord. Persevere together in this place to call on the name of the Lord, even if the world finds you strange. The world that dares to tell us that we're crazy, that we're insane, what's it like? Well, we've seen what it's like. And this word dares to tell us that we're crazy. Let's not be intimidated by this hostile world. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Let's continue to proclaim his glory, to announce his grace. In a sinful world, let's continue to call on the name of the Lord who so loved this world that he sent his only son to die that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's continue to announce that. Despite what the world how the world sniggers and laughs. You're still in the world of Cain and Lamech. We're still living in that world. But we'll call on the name of the Lord. Seth and his family had to call on the name of the Lord to be saved from their sin. And they did it. God granted them salvation. And for many of us, if not all of us here, I trust that's what we've done. We've called on the name of the Lord and he's granted us salvation. And from that day on, we will not stop calling on the name of the Lord. And we will see that where sin abounds, grace will abound even more. Amen. I want to sing this opening psalm from the Psalter, a psalm that speaks about the man who calls in the name of the Lord, who puts his trust in the name of the Lord in a, in a wicked world. There are wicked scorners all around him, but by God's grace he stands firm and calls on the name of the Lord. Let's stand if we can and sing these verses to the tune, Trust number 270. Let's worship God.
Father, you know the challenges that we face day after day, living in a world dominated by unbelief all around us. We see Cain, we see Lamech, we meet him every day, we see him on our television screens, we meet him in the workplace, we meet him uh, all, all over the place, we see them. And it's so easy for us to be intimidated into silence, just to crawl into our little holy huddle within the church and keep ourselves to ourselves. But this word implores us and encourages us to boldly and with confidence to call on the name of the Lord. And so we pray, Father, that you would give us that boldness in a world so hostile to you that mocks your word and mocks your son. We pray, Lord, that we would stand for Jesus and that we would not be intimidated. We would not cower before the pressure of an unbelieving world. Lord, the cost of following you can be high. And we may be mocked, we may be rejected, we may be left out, or worse. But we pray, Lord, that we will be faithful to you. By your grace, you would strengthen us and enable us to stand. And so I pray for each person with their head bowed here that in whatever situation of pressure or temptation they might find themselves to compromise or to silence themselves and to keep their head down. We pray, Lord, that you would give boldness and that we would stand for King Jesus. May we, sing, may we see Christ exalted in our land. May we see Christ exalted in our families, in this village, in the surrounding areas, because your people call on the name of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.